Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to today's uh, micro webinar. This is episode three of our SD Times Live micro webinar series on the fourth pillar of observability. Uh, with uh, uh, Laurent Hamovich again is with us. He's the co-founder and CEO of Ruckout, an observability platform provider. So if you haven't had the chance to uh, view episodes one and two yet, uh, they're available uh, on demand on sdtimes.com. Uh, part one, we looked at snapshots as the fourth pillar of observability. And in part two, we looked at why they are more beneficial than logs, which we determined suck. Uh, so now here we are in uh, part three, <laughs> and we'll be talking about how developer-first observability can help organizations cut their costs. So, Laren, how are you doing today? Awesome, David. It's great being here again. Yes, it is. We're having a, a, a good a good series of talks here. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. so uh, why don't we start uh, talking about what we mean by developer-first observability and how, in fact, it can help organizations uh, save money, time, and effort. So when thinking of developer-first observability, it's kind of a term we coined around a, the observability that's meant, first and foremost, obviously, for developers. There are many attributes to that, and snapshots is a great example of them. But if you look back at observability, observability in many ways grew from the, the realm of ops, from the realm of SREs. And what they mostly care about is, is the system up or is the system down? That's what those people are focused on day in, especially day out, especially during the nights. That's super important, but that's a very, tends to be a fairly black box approach to the software, to the service. Uh, you're looking at a very basic metrics around a request per second, error rates, latencies. Maybe you're looking at the end-to-end -end tests of various kinds of, of business results, but it's very, very uh, black boxy in its nature and very uh, all or nothing. Kind of is the system operating at 100%, at 90% or at 10% or not at all. Mm -hmm. While developers tend to take a much more in-depth look at the system because most of the time developers are not responsible for whether the system is up or down. They're not responsible for monitoring it. And they're definitely not responsible for fixing it, except in the rare cases where they actually broke something or wherever whatever is broken is in their realm. Mm -hmm. Most of the time developers are using observability data such as logs that we've discussed brief, uh, extensively in the previous call to better understand the code to design new features, to redesign old features, to refactor code, to deprecate code, to optimize code, and so on and so forth. And for that, you need a much more granular approach to data collection. You need to look way, way deeper into the nitty gritty details. And even more importantly, the data you need keeps changing because as you are, as you're looking at different types of code, as you're looking at different questions, if you're looking at different parts of the code, you need different different logs, different metrics. You're looking at this line today, you're looking at that file tomorrow, and you keep trying to use new data, data points. Unlike those SREs that are using the same data points, day in, day out, to ascertain the, the state of the system. Now, you mentioned that in the previous call, we've talked about how logging sucks. Now, the key reason logging sucks for developers is that it's a very poor representation of the code, it doesn't, it doesn't provide a good, it's, it can be difficult to connect the log itself with the code. And it's even more difficult to ascertain the state of the code based on the contents of the log line, which tends to, to include no more than two or three variables at best. But one of the things that are, I think the worst about logs is just how expensive they are. And I, I have to say from my experience, it's like the number one complaint from every customer I've been with is how expensive observability is. And even more so that no matter how much you're gonna budget for observability, it's gonna eat up that budget. It's gonna cost you more later on. And by the end of the year, you're probably going to be over. And the next year it's gonna be even more expensive. Mm -hmm. We're seeing customers reporting that not only are they failing to meet their budget goals, but it's also, they're also growing 20% or more mm -hmm. every single year. Right. Well, and it's the main reason for uh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean yeah. to cut you off. I, I just wanted no, to, no, 
I just wanted to explore something here. Uh, observability kind of grew out of what we used to call application performance monitoring. Mm -hmm. and, and none of that really had anything to do with the code. As, as odd as it is to call it application performance monitoring, it had nothing to do with the application. It had to do with how, you know, was it up? Was it available? The service. Was it working? Was yeah. there too much latency? So, so none of that really was created at all with developers in mind. So this is an interesting angle that you're talking about where giving developers the opportunity to collect the data that they need to be more efficient in their jobs, to write better applications, to see what's working and what isn't working, to make those fixes so that things run better is, is really almost a different set of things you're looking for than you did traditionally in application performance monitoring. Exactly. Yeah. And when you use traditional observability monitoring or traditional logging, you're collecting tons and tons of stuff that you will probably never use. We're hearing it from customers that 90 to 95% of the logs are never accessed at all. Yeah. And you're collecting that out of FOMO because engineers know that when they're going to need that data, it's not going to be available. So they fear missing out on it. So they keep collecting it all the time. Mm -hmm. And not to mention that, as we've discussed extensively in the previous call, logging sucks. And even if they do get the data, it might not help them. But because of that uncertainty, whether they're the data is going to be available, they are collecting tons and tons of logs. And that's a huge cost driver. It's also a cost driver often for metrics and other and for traces, where you keep collecting data because you're trying to map out everything. And that more often than not, it that doesn't work and costs you a fortune. And what we found that by providing uh, developers with uh, the ability to determine their own observability, through tools such as snapshots, which is the fourth pillar of observability, or through dynamic logging and other more dynamic approaches, they can determine in real time what they need to collect. And all of a sudden, all of those logs you are collecting just in case are not needed anymore. And you can easily reduce your logging amounts by 80, 90% by, because you don't need the data. It's not being used anyway. It's kept just in case. And if engineers have a better more agile, more flexible approach, those logs become redundant and you can save tons and tons of money. And all of a sudden, you not only have an additional tool or an additional set of tools for data collection, but you end up reducing significantly your total cost of ownership. Mm -hmm. does, this, does this follow along with everything else uh, that we talk about in the industry these days is uh, shifting left, right? So now that we want uh, testing to happen earlier on, we want security to happen earlier on. Now we're talking about perhaps, you know, watching things earlier on in the cycle. Uh, so yeah. is, is this really kind of part of that whole effort, again, to make it better for developers to be able to be more proactive as opposed to collecting all this data towards, uh, you know, after the fact and then try trying to sift through it and see what's going on? Definitely. It's a big element of shift left that we want to give developers more responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And I always, always find the term shift left ironic a bit because it's not as if we're trying to shift more into the lab. We're trying to actually shift the developers into the field, trying to shift the developers into the real world to interact with customers, to interact with the application in the real world. And by providing them with observability tools that meet their needs, that are natural for them, for their skill sets, for their needs uh, and for their abilities and questions, we make it so much more uh, uh, lucrative for them. We make it so much more appealing for them to actually go ahead and try observability because it's, it speaks in their words, in their terms, rather than provide, look, focusing on key elements such as metrics, which are very ops oriented and most developers honestly don't know how to use. Right. Well, exactly. That was the point we made earlier about how those tools were not created for uh, engineers. It was created more for the operations people. So let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. so, so how would organizations then overcome that fear of missing something? And gee, if I don't collect it, I may need it later and I won't have it. How do they move from that towards this more, uh, you know, developer first observability? Like what, what's a, what are some of the steps to get them there? So it's a two pronged approach. On the one hand, obviously, adopt, deploy developer-first observability, whether it's using Rookout or a similar tool to get your developers access to observability on their own terms. And second, you need to start reducing 
logs, trying to re uh, reduce default verbosity cost, cut back, some, cut back on logs, and so on and so forth. Now, one thing, one nice thing is that you don't have to go all in on day one. You can actually use cold storage as a quick alternative. So it's, you can keep some of your logs that you're not certain about, shift them to cold storage. You're going to save 90% instead of 100%. You're still going to save 90% of them. But you know that you have some backup available, uh, you know, so you don't have to go cold turkey on day one. Mm -hmm. That's great. All right. Uh, Leron Hemovich, uh, co-founder, CEO of Rookout. Thanks again for your time. Great speaking with you again. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's been yep. a pleasure. I would like to tell our attendees to, uh, you know, save the date for uh, July the 27th when we'll wrap up part four of this four-part webinar series, looking at troubleshooting and debugging across the software development lifecycle. So that should also be a good one. Uh, so until next time, I'm Dave Rubenstein, Editor-in-Chief of SD Times. So long for now.